He is totally opportunistic, totally narcissistic, and I believe he's racist. Reverend Al Sharpton. My job is to help keep the heat on. The civil rights leader is fired up. I have to obviously ask you about Breonna Taylor. I was still hoping that we'd get at least a manslaughter charge. It was a real miscarriage of justice. Why he'll never stop fighting? These are human beings. This, these people are not props. This is real. Trump's behavior. I think that it's dangerous for the country. And the private pain he reveals for the very first time. I did write about it in the book, but I haven't said it on television. Reverend Sharpton, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here, and congratulations. Man, you're always looking good. I, uh, I don't think I've ever seen you not look good. You, you don't do bad yourself. You know what? You know what? I, I, I attended the Sharpton School for two seconds. You know, I didn't graduate first in the class. My girlfriend is a fashion designer, so she does either get some talent or off the rack and doesn't tell me. She just says, wear this, these are accessories. <laughs> so I don't, I, I, I just keep it simple. That's part of keeping peace at home. So, you know. Hey, I hate to go right to it, but I have to obviously ask you about Breonna Taylor and the decision uh, that came out. I assume you were not surprised, e even if you were heartbroken. Don't get it, shut it down! I was not surprised and I was heartbroken. I think that there was enough evidence there to go to trial. And uh, I, uh, from the beginning when attorney Ben Crump, who represents the family, called me before it became that well known nationally, I had Ben Crump and Brianna's mother on my MSNBC show. Explain how you were told about her uh, death and, and what you went through uh, just on the evening that your d daughter was killed. So I stayed on it. I have members of the board of Nash Action Network in Louisville, so we stayed pretty close on it. And just a couple of weeks ago, Brianna's mother spoke at the big march we had on Washington. Uh, and uh, I was still hoping that we'd get at least a manslaughter charge. And uh, when we didn't get that, I felt it was a, a real miscarriage of justice. I was reassured Wednesday of why I have no faith in the legal system, in the police, in the law that are not made to protect us black and brown people. So, so what does it say to you that this keeps happening? Because I grew up in Miami, and you may or may not remember Miami in the 80s, but sadly, we had a lot of these situations, so much so that my mom was always scared when I left the house. We had Arthur McDuffie, we had, you know, we had multiple situations where unarmed black men shot and killed. In McDuffie's case, he was a former Marine insurance salesman. They followed him home into his garage, killed him in his garage, in part with a flashlight. As to manslaughter, as charged with count two of the information, not guilty. And then a jury let the police officers off. Were you given immunity? I was today, yes. What has to happen so that when things like this happen, someone actually does get charged? We come to Washington by the thousands. We gonna call their name. We gonna call their name. We have supported, and uh, at the big march on Washington that Martin Luther King III and I uh, co-convened, we supported the George Floyd Police and Justice Act which would outlaw com killing a policeman, killing anyone by uh, compression, which is either choke hole like Eric Gardner suffered in New York or George Floyd did. I'm Let sorry. me see your other please, hand. Please, Mr. Officer. Both hands. Yeah, do nothing. But it would also uh, move this immunity police have from being sued. All these lawsuits, $12 million lawsuit with uh, the Breonna uh, uh, Kate Taylor case in Louisville, it's paid by taxpayers. When policemen know they can lose their house, their car, I think they are a little more cautious on how they're gonna use deadly force. Also, they, are, uh, they must have transparency in their background. Too often when we see someone killed by police, we learn of the background of the victim, but what about the police? Do they have a background of other harassment complaints or other complaints about aggressive policing? So we need federal law. Rev, talk to me about how this could become law. 
Um, you know, in the 60s, there was a time in which it seemed really unlikely that you could get a uh, Civil Rights Act passed, Voting Rights Act passed, a series of others, but we obviously went on an uh, unusual and amazing journey and even won over some people who previously were opposed. How could you see this actually happening in today's Senate, in today's House? What I think flips uh, people is their own self-interest. If the young people keep marching, if all of us with organizations do like we did the march on Washington and keep putting pressure on, and if people vote, they are Martin Luther King used to say that there are two types of uh, leaders. You have thermometers and you have thermostats. Thermometers come in a room and say the temperature is 65. Thermostats are in the room to change the temperature up to 80 or bring it down to 40. And there are those of us that are the thermostats. We turn the heat up. Others judge the temperature and say, I better go there because it's getting hot in here. My job is to help keep the heat on until we can make the thermometer go to the level that they become uncomfortable enough to say, we have to do something to bring the heat down, make some new laws. You, you know, Jesse uh, uh, used to call them uh, tree shakers and jelly makers, right, uh, yeah. which was not exactly the same, but, but similar. Uh, you know, catalysts and consolidators. Rev, it's interesting, the, um, the set of experiences you've had and the set of skills you've built are of such an interesting combination that I'm left to wonder if you were coming up today and you had you as a mentor and you saw this young boy, Alfred uh, Sharpton, what would you tell him to go and do? I would tell him the first thing is don't try to be like me. Find your own spot. Be authentic. Learn some of the things from me uh, in terms of the trade. But then make it your way. Do it your way. Find your own style, your own rhythm. I, like I said, was mentioned by Reverend Jones, Reverend Jackson, but I don't imitate them. I emulate what they poured into me, but the things I do, my style and all, is all a combination of things that made me me. And that's what I'd say, don't be afraid to be you. You're not a mistake. Your gifts, your talents, your abilities were given to you. Now you protect them and develop them. Don't try to be uh, something that you're not. I wanted to be a civil rights leader. I didn't want a big church. My ministry was not to pastor one church. I wanted to be everywhere and do what I'm doing. Who would have thought when I started in Brooklyn, marching and picketing, that I would grow to run for president or have a, a national cable show or syndicated radio show? There's no career plan for what I did. You can't sit there and say now this. There wasn't even an MSNBC in existence when I started. So you couldn't plan it, but if you do you, the things will come. You know, the church folk used to say, seek ye first the kingdom, and all these things will be added to you. If you do you, you will find an, a, a way that your course will be charted. Don't talk to us like we stupid. Don't talk to us like we ignorant. We love our children like you love yours. Rep, talk to me, you, you have been blessed in this life to meet so many interesting people across so many different arenas. So you've not only met people uh, in the spiritual realm, but you've also met people in politics, you've met people uh, in business, you've met people in music and entertainment. Tell me a little bit, just I'm, I'm broadly curious about two or three of the most interesting people you've come across in this life. Joining James Brown, Muhammad Ali, and myself now from New York City is the Reverend Al Sharpton. The first and foremost would be James Brown, the Godfather of Soul. One, two, three, four. Get up, get up, get up, get up, when I was 18 years old, I had my own youth group in Brooklyn, New York. And a guy came in uh, to New York from the South who's the same age as me, 18. And he joined my youth group. And we found out his name was Teddy, and he was James Brown's son. About seven, eight months later, he was killed in a car accident. This was 73. Some of the disc jockeys in New York said, you know, there's this teenage preacher, 18, same age as your son, that your son joined his youth group. If you want to do something to memorialize your son and they won't pick at you, 
you should do it with this kid. Soon I became like a surrogate son to him and he became the father I didn't have. Uh, so he was a very entrepreneurial guy, a demanding guy. I was not allowed to hang out with the band. You're a preacher, you're gonna stay. I promise your mother I will keep you in the church. James Brown was probably the most interesting person I ever met. Probably second to him was Reverend Jesse Jackson, who mentored me in, in civil rights. I've known him since I was 12. I am, I am black, 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 beautiful, beautiful. Black. Reverend Jackson was flamboyant and was gusto, my kind of guy. And I modeled myself a lot after him in my teenage years. Uh, 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 medallion and all he used to wear, and Shirley Chisholm. I stand before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. Shirley Chisholm uh, was the first black woman to go to Congress and ran for president in 72. But she knew me because of my preaching around Brooklyn as a kid. And I became one of the youth coordinators for a campaign for president. So she would always be very strict uh, 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 she would call me Alfred. My full name was Alfred. Alfred, you pronounced that word wrong. Alfred, you didn't do this. Alfred, and, uh, and she was one that would always make me very cognizant of how I was sitting and all that. So, uh, and, and you, it's a funny thing, uh, Carlos, when you're around these people and know them, you never have a sense of who they are in history. And then you think about it as you recount it later in life and say, I was blessed at a very young age in formative years to know people who became historic figures. Rev, how does someone become an effective boy preacher? Because it's one thing to give one sermon, but it's another thing to continue to give sermons and to do it in such a way that people continue to respect you. How did you manage to be an effective boy preacher for a meaningful period of time? When I, when I was a boy preacher and when I started, Bishop Washington, who was my pastor, let me preach at four. And uh, I just wanted to preach. I used to preach to my uh, sister's dolls at home. And uh, I, it was all inspiration and I would, uh, go home from church service on Sundays and get my mother's bathrobe and put it on like it was the bishop's robe and preach. And he let me preach at church. 900 people was there the first sermon. So I developed a reputation, and you're right, four, five, six, seven, it's cute. But you get around 10 and 11, it ain't as cute. You get in your teens, it's not cute anymore. And that's why I give credit to Reverend Jackson. Uh, Jesse said to me, uh, boy preacher, you better learn some content because you can get away with that uh, fluff when you're young, but when you start coming into age, you're gonna have to have something to say. You can't get up there and holler and scream. And that's when I would start reading books. And I think as I grew, I let my ministry grow and my intellect grow and my commitment grow. My passion was the same, but I had more content. You can't I kept challenging myself to grow, and I still do. You know, one of the things that I do is I get up every morning around four and I go work out. And, and I do, you know, the, the elliptical, and I do the, the uh, bicycles, and I do the weights and all. And anytime it starts getting easy, I, you know, push-ups, 40 push-ups, I'll say, well, now next week I'll go to 50. Anything easy, you never know what you can do. You must continue to set goals for yourself. Otherwise, you become a, a re you start retrenching. And, and one of the things I tell a lot of the young uh, people in my organization is always let your uh, reach for something just beyond your grasp because it'll make you stretch further till you can grasp it. If you only reach for what you can easily grasp, you're not really seeing how far you can stretch. And, and I'm in my 60s now, but I'm still stretching. What, what gives you the most pride? When you were in a quiet moment, when you were up at 4 a.m. by yourself, like, like what gives you the greatest, greatest pride? 
I think the greatest pride is when I joined uh, the movement the last year of Dr. King's life and grew up under people like Reverend Jackson, Reverend Jones, that I wanted to be one to keep the movement going in the North. All of them were Southerners, uh, Reverend Jones, Jesse, Dr. King and all. And I felt there was institutional racism in the North. And I'm most proud that I think I've been on the vanguard of those that brought the North the King nonviolence uh, kind of movement and worked very closely with his son, uh, Martin III, uh, because I, I think that the older you get, the more you understand that things don't begin with you and don't end with you, but if you can be a strong link in something bigger than you, then you've done your part. And I wanted to be that link that helped to bring the movement and, and cement it in the North. And I think even my critics would have to say I've been able to help do that. You, you know, that's profound, Rev. I think you're right. And I didn't think about it that way, but I think you're right. And it's interesting, even as you think about Dr. King moving the conversation further North in his last couple of years, spending that time in Chicago and, and beginning to, to try and bridge that conversation, obviously coming to Riverside, uh, a church uh, to talk about a variety of things, including economics and, and the war in Vietnam, et cetera, that it still, it, it wasn't there. And there certainly was an absence with Malcolm, with Malcolm gone. Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? What has been hardest for you? You know, we, we see some of the successes but, but flip it to the other side, because I assume nothing is ever easy and up and to the right all the time. What has been hardest for you? The hardest is trying to stay uh, balanced is in a uh, tumultuous area. So you're dealing with killings and you're dealing with discrimination in jobs and contracts and all. So you're always in the eye of a storm. You're always in the eye of a controversy. And the most difficult thing to do is to be stable and steady amidst all of the turbulence. Now, I've had sometimes fail. I've let sometimes my vanity outweigh. I talk about that in the book. Sometimes your vanity can outweigh your sanity, I say, where you get caught up in, oh, is this going to make the news? What does this look like? And you've got to say, wait a minute, steady yourself. It's about the cause. It's not about you. Sometimes your anger will make you say things. Mrs. King used to get on me about that. And you'd say things, and I'd say, yeah, but I was speaking from my heart. And she said, but words matter. So you've got to become disciplined to remain steady and balanced and not give in to whatever is tempting you or whatever is emotions. You've got to be able to put that all in check because you represent more than you. The families that you fight for with police brutality or the people excluded in contracts, they have the right to expect that you are not going to have the emotions they have because they didn't ask to be a civil rights leader. You did. They didn't ask to be out front of a cause. You did. They were victimized against their will or wish. You supposed to help bring their thing to the public and try to get some change, which means you got to be thinking, not reacting, and not trying to be just up front for being up front's sake. And we thank God for the dream, and we're going to keep on fighting until the dream is a reality. Thank you, God. Actually, Rev, talk about that a little bit, because I, I have to admit that I haven't thought carefully enough about what the emotions must be if you're Breonna Taylor's mom or you're Ahmaud Arbery's uh, parents or, uh, or, or Tamir Rice or or Trayvon's uh, parents. And you've been with many of these parents when they're in their grieving, and I'm not sure the grieving ever ends, but when the grieving is fresh. What might surprise people about what is going on for those folks as they are, you know, simultaneously missing someone they love and trying to seek justice? What, what might surprise us about what is going on for them? I think you hit it right away is that this is a loved one to them. And they uh, one day wake up and this son of theirs, brother of theirs, husband, uh, daughter, or niece is dead. And it could be by police, it could be by racists, but they're dead. And there's 50 cameras outside. And they've never talked to a camera in their life. And it's a whirlwind 
and all they're dealing with is why are they dead? They, they, they're hurt. They're going to have a, a loved one gone. Many of them don't even have the finances to have a funeral. We paid for a lot of funerals and paid people's rent because they didn't have, nobody plans to be a martyr. And I constantly say to people uh, down through the years, to us, it's a cause. To them, that's their loved one. So don't expect them to react the way do, we do. So you have to help them through that. That is one of the reasons why I like an attorney, Ben Crump, and others call us, because we come in and understand that, because we've been through this before. And families are in shock and thrown on the front page. And can you imagine that you're finding out your brother's dead and the next thing is, no, don't talk like that. You've got to make this six o'clock appearance on so-and-so show. And like, you're in no man's land and you need people to help guide you through that. To this day, on Mother's Day, I call maybe 20 mothers that I've worked with down through the years and they call me for my uh, daughter's birthdays and my daughter's in their 30s now and they call me on mine. We become bonded because you go through that period with them that never ends. I'll never forget that when we uh, went to commit George Floyd's body to the uh, ground at the cemetery. I not only did the eulogies, I went with the family to actually say the last words over him. And there was only about 200 people that was allowed in that little chapel. Because remember now, this is during the pandemic. So we had to be socially distant. And I remember that when I watched that tape of George Floyd with the uh, policeman's knee on his neck, eight minutes and 46 seconds, toward the end, when he was gasping and almost dying, he started calling for his mother. And I remember that I said to Ben Crump, the lawyer, I said, uh, I really want to talk to his mother. I know she's hurting. He said, his mother's dead. I said, dead, but he was calling for his mother. He said, she's dead. And that is what struck me that, like me, when all else was gone, you called mama. And even though she wasn't there anymore, he's calling mama. Well, the family decided when we did the three funerals, to bury him in Houston next to his mother. And I went to get in the car to leave, and the brother traveling with me said, you still tear up, this still gets to you. And I said, you know, when it doesn't get to you, you need to stop doing it. And that's why I could take the flack I take in the controversy, because I believe in what I'm doing. I even tell families, I said, let me tell you something. They're gonna write about me like a dog tomorrow. Let them come after me rather than y'all, because you know y'all got some stuff we don't want to eat out in public, so let them come after me. That's part of my job, is let them come beat up on me so they don't beat up on y'all. Rev, tell me a little bit about Trump, because Trump was active in New York circles for years. I know you've probably known him for a long time, known him deeply. I know there were even times when he was an active financial supporter of various elements of the civil rights movement, so I know it surprises some people. Why the transformation, and, and what have you seen? I think Donald Trump is the ultimate uh, opportunist. He will do whatever works for Donald Trump. He's a narcissist. and. It's all about him. Uh, in the 70s, when I was a kid, he, was, he and his father were sued by the Justice Department for discrimination. So that was the first I heard of him and went to some of the marches against him. The Department of Justice accused the Trumps of violating the Fair Housing Act, arguing they were turning away renters based on race and color. But then what taught with me was when he started his birtherism thing that Obama wasn't born here. And this was blatant racist to me. He's not one of us. No one is happier, no one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. So we met at the Trump Towers. We argued 45 minutes. I said, it is racist and you know it's racist and you have no evidence this man was born in Kenya. And, uh, but he knew it worked. So when we walked out of his office, I got in the elevator and I told my friend, I said, I'm gonna say on my show tonight, because I was on then five nights a week, about this meeting, because Trump is gonna tweet something different. And he tweeted, Reverend Al came to see me today and softened his views on me, apologized to me, we're friends. And I said, that's not true. And about a little while later, 
We went, uh, they, they had the 40th anniversary of Saturday Night Live and all of us that had hosted would come and sit there in the studio and they had this big special. So every name you could think of, cause that's who uh, did Saturday Night Live. Donald Trump was sitting there with his wife and I'm walking by him, it's the first time I saw him since we had it out in his office and I blasted him on my show. And I look at him and he kind of smiles and he leans over and he thumb shakes my hand and he says, you got to do what you got to do. I got to do what I got to do. And that's when I knew, I said, this guy's really bought into this, thinking this can bring him somewhere. There's no return for him. And that's when it was, we finished talking. And he ran for president, but birtherism is what made him. And once he won, I remember uh, about three or four weeks after he won for president, I went on Morning Joe that morning as a guest. But we've got this flexible definition about what a racist is. What do you have to spray paint the N-word in the Oval Office or have a hood in, in the Lincoln's bedroom to be a racist? He is building this into the very fabric of policy in this country. I get off the television and I go, we were having a board meeting that morning on National Action Network. In the middle of the board meeting, my cell phone starts ringing. I have it on uh, silence. And I picked up and quietly said, uh, I'm in a board meeting, you gotta uh, leave a message. And the voice on the other side said, would you hold on for the president-elect? And Trump comes on, Al, I saw you this morning. You got me right, you know me. It's us against them, these guys. And he starts using profanity and all. And he invites me to Mar-a-Lago. And I said, you know I'm not coming to Mar-a-Lago. You're not gonna set me up for the photo op. That's all you want to get. No, 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 because there's a lot we can do. I said, I'm not doing it. And uh, that was the first time I talked to him after the election. He is totally opportunistic, totally narcissistic, and I believe he's racist. No one could be comfortable with the racism he spews unless they really feel that way, which means he has some deep-seated bigotry. And uh, I think that it's dangerous for the country. Rev, I know I gotta let you go, so I wanna end with rapid fire. Uh, I wanna hit you with five or six questions and I wanna know whatever comes to your mind right away. All right. Other than your own book, uh, what's one of your favorite books? Uh, the book by uh, Frederick Douglass uh, by uh, Blight that came out about two years ago. Your favorite comedian? Uh, probably was Dick Gregory, but uh, Dick is gone. I don't really, I love David Ch uh, Chappelle though. Dave Chappelle's good. He's real good. The country that you haven't visited that you would like to visit? I would love to visit Egypt. I've never been to Egypt. I've been all over the Middle East, never went to Egypt. I want to see uh, the pyramids. Um, uh, something that will surprise people in your new book? Uh, my talking about private conversations with Trump and, and Obama. I'm probably one of the few people that have had real close conversations with both of the last two presidents. Hey, uh, Rep, I hope this won't be the last time. Uh, uh, just absolutely enjoyed having you on. Uh, such, a, uh, such a treat, and I hope you'll do it again. Thank you. Thank you. Always good to see you, and thank you for having me on. God bless. Hey, I really hope you enjoyed the conversation with Reverend Al. I've always enjoyed talking to him and he always has interesting things to say. You know, where do I start? I love what he said about being a boy preacher that was super interesting, including his maturation along the way. You know, you gotta have some meat as well as the gravy. I kinda like that. I love this talk about mentors. Uh, Shirley Chisholm, uh, the late Congresswoman, is a hero of mine, so hearing him talk about her was interesting and she's still the teacher. Um, I love some of the wisdom and the compassion that he showed with the families of some of the unarmed black people who've been killed. Hey, if you enjoyed this, I hope that you'll subscribe. Hope you'll tell a friend. But this time around, I hope you'll listen to the podcast because that's got the whole deal. And I promise you there was so much we couldn't get it all in one place. Thanks for the time. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into the Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.